All right. So do you want to just kick off by introducing yourself? Um, and for anyone that might be interested in your job as a future career, do you want to just describe what it is that you do and what your day-to-day looks like? Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm a media and campaigns officer at Positive Money. So basically that involves press work, so writing press releases, um, putting out comments in response to breaking news, prepping our uh, spokespeople for briefings and interviews, um, liaising with journalists and things like that. But then there's also a content creation aspect to my job. So I make videos and I make blogs um, and I look after a lot of our social media output too. So there's obviously been a lot to respond to this week with lots of uh, Liz Truss's policies being floated in the media. So it's been a, a busy week or two. Um, and the mini budget is out today, so we'll have lots to say about that. Yes, my God, it's been quite a few weeks, hasn't it? Um, and some really interesting kind of policies being announced or talked about in the news. Um, we'll get on to all of that stuff um, as as we go along, but can you just talk more about what Positive Money is about? Um, you know, what kind of campaigns are you working on? What's your mission? Yeah, so we were set up post-crash to reimagine the economy as one that works for people and the planet rather than a handful of wealthy elites and bankers. Um, So we work across four key areas. One of those is democratising money and banking. So basically, we think that money should be a tool that works in the public interest um, and doesn't concentrate power in small bubbles or reinforce structures of oppression. Uh, So we need a diverse banking system which serves different needs, be that communities' access to banking and finance services, investing in a green transition or reducing inequality. The second area we work in is um, creating a Green Bank of England. So basically trying to raise awareness that the Bank of England is a regulator of all of the UK's commercial banks. So as such, it has the power to basically steer money away from fossil fuels, make lending to those more expensive and make lending to green, clean energies cheaper. Um, And then once we raise awareness of that, we then move on to campaigning for that. Uh, And then one of the third thing we do is um, working on this idea of a well-being economy. So basically the idea here is that we need to move away from GDP and growth and the stock market booming as measures of how well we're doing as a society because even if these things are growing that wealth isn't distributed equally so it doesn't materially improve the lives of most people if GDP keeps going up Um, so we need to use different metrics that affect everyone like healthcare, education, housing, environmental health to see how well everyone's really doing Um, and then the fourth area is new economy thinking so this is basically the idea that mainstream economics it it doesn't equip us to deal with the crises of today so be it climate change soaring inequality pandemics um, the energy crisis it doesn't provide us with solutions to those things so what we need is a more pluralist approach that brings in perspectives on racial justice on feminism on the environment which have been traditionally excluded from mainstream economics Gosh, there's no small task. There's a lot going on there. And, um, you know, really brilliant stuff. You're really speaking my language in terms of trying to make the economy fairer and to make it work, you know, not just for society, but for the environment as well. Um, But is this just a, a poor people's campaign? Does anyone else care about... Um, equality and fairness and stability you know uh, you would you would hope so but um, there doesn't seem to be much action from the top to redesign how things are done so far yeah well I think we, we have influential supporters of our campaigns a number of MPs and peers you know um, with political influence appear on our panels at events like report launches or party conferences will be at the Labour and Conservative Party conferences this year with MPs from both parties on our panels discussing the future of finance in the UK and how it can work for everyone. Um, And many of them share our work 
and the work of other organisations in our space, be that on social media or even on the floor in Parliament, in hearings, in debates, in um, committee sessions. So I think there is, there are a lot of MPs that want to do more for people. Obviously, there are some politicians who might not personally care about um, the well-being of most people. But if these issues are impacting their constituents who elect them, then they have to care. I think that's why it's so important to make our collective voice heard. Um, and show that we do care about these issues. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned GDP there. So to my mind, all, problem lead, all problems lead back to that. You know, it's this faulty metric. Um, can you explain what GDP actually is and why it's, in, why it's, impo- why it's a problem? Um, and if we have any hope of a fairer society until we change it? Yeah, so GDP, gross domestic product, is effectively effectively the growth of our economy. Um, There has been steady but small growth of the UK economy over the last few years. But as Clive Lewis said in Parliament yesterday, um, if GDP GDP growth equals um, a better society, then why aren't most people better off? Why haven't most people seen their living standards improve over the last few years? And I think the reason is that even though the economic pie is getting bigger, most people aren't getting a bigger slice of that pie. And I think particularly troubling is when we're talking about growing the financial sector, which is something Liz Truss is adamant that she's going to do. Um, There's been a proposed amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill which basically shapes how our financial services sector is going to look post-Brexit. And they're trying to bring in an objective for regulators to consider the international competitiveness of the firms they regulate when they're setting and enforcing the rules. Um, And obviously, that means they can't effectively regulate those firms if they're having to consider whether sanctions or fines against them or new rules to stop them, you know, misbehaving essentially will affect their competitiveness globally. It's essentially just a race to the bottom on who can have the lowest bar for rules to attract overseas investment. But the problem with that is we end up attracting even more dirty money and we're already a haven for dirty money in the UK. And this even actually poses a national security risk because obviously if we're attracting lots of money from oligarchs, then they have a sway on our political system and our democracy. Um, It also just flies in the face of levelling up. This government's been talking a lot about levelling up the UK, distributing wealth amongst different regions, but all this does growing the financial sector is further concentrate money in the city of London. So there's also a clear contradiction between net zero goals and environmental goals and growing the financial sector, because if we're just pouring money into the financial sector, the financial sector invests that in what's profitable, and that at the moment is fossil fuels. So there's a clear contradiction there as well. Um, And also it doesn't necessarily work. In In our recent lobbying report, we cite studies from the University of Sheffield and from the IMF, where they actually show that at a certain point, unconstrained growth of the financial sector is bad for the rest of the economy. It starts to take away from the rest of the economy rather than give to it. Um, so yeah, lots of different reasons why GDP growth is not a great thing for um, most people in this country. Yeah, and something that I want to add to that as well is that we have a target to reach net zero emissions by 2050. It's embedded into UK law. Um, and yet this new um, bill that you're talking about that is, um, you know, giving regulators um, the job of making sure that financial services grow and are internationally competitive, um, it has admitted to give them an objective that would consider our net zero, our kind of a net zero target and um, our need, our desperate need to reduce emissions um, if we're going to, you know, uh avoid more environmental catastrophes and nature loss and all of those things that are really unsettling um the planet 
So if that's another objective that I would like to see them consider. Yes, we're part of a group called Finance for Our Future. It's sort of a coalition of organisations. And we're basically asking exactly for that, for them to have to consider net zero rather than consider growth of the financial sector, consider net zero and reaching that goal and being aligned with the Paris Agreement, that that should be something they're having to focus on rather than GDP growth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it can be compatible in many cases. Um, There's a debate around whether we need green growth or whether degrowth is is the answer if if we want to protect people and planet. Um, But, you know, green growth is is possible. We can invest in green technologies to help us meet those net zero targets and um, align ourselves with the Paris Agreement. So, yeah, there's lots of ways that we can still be... uh, you know, still experience prosperity, but also do well for the environment and people. Um, so I'm a fan of, yeah, go on, sorry. I, I think yeah, um, like we also have to be honest that, you know, at the start, it won't be more profitable to go green. There will be like upfront costs to the transition, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it. And actually the cost of doing nothing will be much greater, which we can talk about later. Um, but essentially... It is important to be honest that that there will be costs and it won't be, you know, for banks, it won't be the most profitable thing to invest in clean and green rather than dirty because fossil fuels are just cheaper at the moment. But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, And also, like, we can see an explosion in jobs in this sector, in the sector, in clean energies. And there was recent news that um, for the first time, there are now more jobs in clean energy than there are in dirty which is like such a great move um towards the future of this yeah absolutely that's an important point i think it's like those there is this upfront cost um but over the long term we're going to we're all going to do better if we do um invest in it now um so moving on to the next question uh, and just talking about the wealth gap um, you mentioned that being a serious issue. I think it's it's such a serious issue that I think uh, insurers actually sent a risk warning to their clients to say that there's an increased risk of civil unrest um, because of the cost of living and um, the, pan- the effects of the pandemic and all of those types of things. So... People are really feeling the pinch in a big way Um, and businesses are being warned that it could lead to, you know, damage to property. Um, Civil unrest is a real thing. There's um, somebody that I find quite interesting as a a kind of a messenger around um, the wealth gap, uh, the inequality economist Gary Stevenson, and he's campaigning for... Um, a bigger wealth tax. Do you, how, what do you think about that? And do you think it's fair to tax the wealthy, or is that going to cause even more fractures in society? I think that ultimately, yes, it is fair to tax those with vast amounts of disposable income more than we tax those who are struggling to heat their homes and feed their families right now. Um, I think Gary Stevenson is an interesting example because he's someone who did make lots of money in the financial services sector and then turned around and said, you know what, this isn't fair. Um, And there are groups like patriotic millionaires who are very wealthy people who are saying, you know, hey, we need to be taxed more. This isn't fair. So there is even support for it amongst those groups as well. Um, And there were during the pandemic, you know, there were large numbers of famous millionaires and billionaires signing open letters saying, you know, tax us more. But I think specifically, we should be taxing unearned wealth like that gained via ownership of multiple properties. Um, So basically, we could have taxes increasing for every home that you own to dampen demand for, you know, multiple home ownership and allow first time buyers onto the property ladder rather than all the homes getting snapped up by people who already own homes. Um, And I think it's also important when we're talking about like taxing the wealthy that we're not always talking about individuals, 
but we're talking about companies too, um, with a bit of extra taxation on banks, on energy companies who are making windfall profits, record profits right now, we could basically lift millions of people out of poverty and it, it just means slimming down their profit margins a bit. You know, they're not going to become unprofitable a lot of the time. Um, they just won't be as profitable. And that there have been arguments against this, basically saying that um, if you tax energy companies too much, they won't reinvest. But lots of research has shown that actually where they invest their money is into share buybacks and into paying dividends to shareholders. So it's not going back to reinvestment in public services at all. Um, and another argument against it was was companies claiming that it would damage pension funds in the UK because of their investments in oil and gas. Well, research from Commonwealth earlier this year found that 0.2% of British of Britain's main pension funds was invested in Shell and BP. So it's a tiny percentage of that portfolio. So basically, there's no reason we shouldn't be taxing them more. Yeah, can you explain why it is that banks and energy companies are making these like booming profits right now, yet we're all struggling? What what's happened there? So it it started with uh, you know linking it to inflation. Inflation obviously started getting bad during the pandemic, where there were supply chain disruptions, and so there was a demand and supply issue where there was still the same amount of demand, but not enough supply. But that's not that's not so much what we're seeing anymore. What we're seeing since the invasion of Ukraine is a gas crisis where the international cost of gas has gone through the roof. So basically, energy companies have made windfall profits, unexpected profits from that boom. Um, and we're all paying the price for it, which is just another reason we need to get off of fossil fuels. Um, a lot of a lot of politicians at the moment are arguing that we could have gas from the UK and that would help the crisis. Well, firstly, just drilling it in the UK doesn't mean it would bring down the cost internationally. We, we wouldn't produce enough as a nation to bring down the international cost. Secondly, that oil and gas would be owned by the companies drilling it, not the UK government. So it's not like they would give it to us for a discount. You know, it would still cost the same amount. And thirdly, it's obviously really bad for the environment, um, not in line with our net zero goals and bad for people's health. This new idea of lifting the ban on fracking is a terrible idea and it's still got massive earthquake risk in the UK. It's still massively unpopular. Uh, Lord Devon, who heads up the Climate Change Committee in the UK, has said that it won't bring prices down. Uh, you've got Quadrilla, the, the fracking giant in the UK, saying that the UK isn't suitable for fracking. So basically, we just need to get off gas. Um, and the best way to do that is to invest in retrofitting of our homes so that we don't need as much of it, demand us down, um, and getting everything on the electrical grid. Yeah, I mean, why aren't these politicians listening? Economists, scientists, you know, people that know their stuff are telling these politicians that these new ideas are not good ones and um, there's a reason why we banned fracking um, and and all the rest of it why aren't they listening i think so we released a report earlier this year on lobbying um called the power of big finance and it basically looked at the oversized influence that the banking sector has on politicians so we found that you know between throughout 2020 and 2021 MPs and political parties received over £17 million from banks and their lobbyists. Um, over a third of Treasury meetings were with just this one sector, the banking sector. And, you know, financial firms that hired a former uh, Chancellor saw an uptake of 59% in their meetings with the Treasury. They have this huge influence over politics. Over a fifth of peers in the House of Lords have also got jobs in the financial sector, including over half of those who sit on the committee in the House of Lords that's supposed to regulate the financial sector, supposed to scrutinise the financial sector. So they have this huge influence over our politicians, over our democracy, and essentially banks want what's profitable. So if something's good for the banks, that's what politicians are going with because they're following the money. And we really need to undo that 
We need much stronger transparency, much stricter rules on lobbying and spending and what can be donated, donations to MPs and political parties. It all needs to be stripped back. It needs to be much smaller um, so that the ordinary people who the politicians are supposed to be working for, who they're elected to work for and who they're paid to work for are the people they're actually working for. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, why? So why are they <laughs> listening? You know, we're the people that are voting them into power. Um, you know, surely our voting power has got to be more powerful than these um, individual lobbyists. What's going on there? Is democracy completely broken? I was going to say one of the things we are... Uh we called for in that report is a ban on second jobs because if, if you have a second job in another sector and that one's paying a lot more then obviously they're working for that sector more than they're working for the public um so we called for an outright ban on second jobs i think with regards to democracy i think i don't think it's broken but i think faith in it is at an all-time low um polling from carnegie uk at the start of this year found that less than half of the English public feel that democracy works well in the UK and an overwhelming majority, around three quarters, don't trust MPs, don't trust the government to make decisions that will improve their lives. Um, and as I say, I think the reason the needs of so many are overlooked is that, you know, we have sectors like the financial sector, also other sectors like oil and gas who, who have disproportionate impact influence over public policy makers not just in government but in you know the bank of england who also set rules we found that over a third of all their policy makers historically over three quarters even have worked in private finance um, a couple of the sitting members of policy making committees there still work in private finance still have second jobs in that and they're setting the rules for private finance while also being employed by or receiving share payments from private finance. Um, so that's what really needs to be undone. Yeah, gosh, so much interesting stuff. Thank you. This is, is really, um, really interesting. So I'm going to move on now to um, climate and the impact climate related risk um, has or potentially has on our economy. Um, I wonder if you could just explain what the Bank of England climate stress tests were and uh, whether we should be worried about the results of those. Yeah, so the climate stress tests, essentially the Bank of England um, ran through their modelling software, three scenarios, one where UK banks respond swiftly to climate breakdown one where they respond but slowly with a delayed response and one where they don't respond at all and they basically found that um, British banks could stand to lose hundreds of billions of pounds if they failed to act promptly which could obviously sow the seeds of another financial crisis as well as accelerating climate breakdown um, but I think what we really need to see from the Bank of England is moving beyond these data gathering exercises and moving towards genuine action. Um, or if you are gonna be you know, gathering data, there's, there's this, the technical name for it is double materiality, but basically this idea is that as well as measuring the impacts of you know, climate on banks, you measure the impact that banks are having on the climate um, so that you can appropriately act and you know, negate that risk. Um, and this is something we'll be talking about in, oh, well, our research team will be talking about in um, the updated release of our green central banking scorecard, which is coming out in November, um, basically where we rank the G20 banks based on their climate policies um, and see, you know, who's leading the pack there and who's lagging behind. So, yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Because um, I know the European Central Bank has been making some progressive moves on climate. Um, can you talk about some of the some of the things that the ECB is doing, just to just to compare it to the Bank of England and what they're not doing? 
Yeah, I mean, the, there was news from the ECB just the other day that um, firms could be sued if they're not, you know, um, following climate rules. But they've also recently said that they will, they're going to shift to sort of only investing in companies that have strong climate policies, that have, you know, strong disclosure, transition plans, um, and that there will be penalisation for firms that are greenwashing or that don't stick to those plans. And that's just not something we're seeing from the Bank of England at the moment. Um, so can you talk about, maybe give us a few sort of specific policies that you would love to see Liz Truss and, and gang introduce to um, create a better, fairer, um, greener economy? Um, so I think one thing we, we would, well, in an ideal world, instead of, you know, capping energy prices at two and a half thousand pounds, which is still way more expensive than they were at the start of the year, we would pull it back to pre-April levels. Um, I don't think we're going to see that, but that would be, you know, an ideal policy. Um, most of them will be not doing things that they've said they, they're going to do. So not lifting the ban on fracking, not scrapping the cap on bankers' bonuses, because, you know, it's already double their salary that they can make in bonuses. Banks were already set to pay out four billion in bonuses this year. They paid out 2.6 billion in bonuses last year. So these aren't the people that need your help right now. Um, and doing it under the guise of, you know, competitiveness and wanting to attract talent to the city of London. Well, there hasn't been a huge exodus of bankers post Brexit, um, which we were told there would be, but that hasn't happened. Um, so I don't think we need to to focus on making the city more attractive right now for workers um, in that sector. We also don't want the... So basically Liz Truss is talking about reversing the um, increased corporation tax that Rishi Sunak announced last year. Um, so last year Sunak cut taxes that banks would have to pay and he basically justified this by saying, well, corporation tax is going up, so they'll have to pay more that way. And now Liz Truss is going back on that um, and saying, actually, we're not going to increase corporation tax. So banks just got a huge tax cut last year that's completely unjustifiable. Um, so that really won't help anyone except them. Um, and we also think that, you know, this, uh, this idea, Liz Truss wants to merge three key city watchdogs. She's floated that idea. Um, and these watchdogs were set up after the financial crisis. The financial services sector was split up, so there were more regulators and she wants to merge them all back together again, which is just rewinding to post-crash rules and undoing things we did after the crash to make the system more secure. Um, so yeah, the policies we want to see are mostly things we don't want them to do. But in terms of what we do want them to do, um, New Economics Foundation and Fuel Poverty Action have floated this idea of free basic energy. So everyone gets a free amount covered by the government to, to do the basics, to, to turn the oven on, to heat their house. Um, but beyond that, costs would become more expensive. Um, so for people heating enormous houses or using more and more energy, you have a scaling cost where it gets more and more expensive for everything that gets used beyond the essentials. Um, and that's something they're both campaigning for at the moment. So yeah, that's something we'd love to see. And also uh, rent controls and eviction bans. Um, yeah. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit more about those rent controls and eviction bans and and why that's something that you're interested in? Yeah, um, we did a housing report. <laughs> we did a housing report earlier this year. We published one. Um, and essentially, I mean, if you look at the rent controls that companies in Europe, countries in Europe have, um, they're so much stronger than here. And they're something we used to have, you know, pre-Thatcher. Um, that report basically looks at the housing affordability crisis in the UK and says that actually <clears throat> what we're often told is the reason people can't get on the property ladder is because there aren't enough properties. It's a supply problem. We're not building enough. And actually the problem is that during, you know, Thatcher's premiership, she introduced all these rules 
which turned homes into financial assets. Um, so it, it became profitable to own multiple homes and that was an, and that's sort of been encouraged. Um, and actually now it's, it's so common for people to own multiple homes that that's the reason people can't get on the property ladder. There was, a, there was an explosion in the private rental sector. It's now enormous in the UK. I live in Brighton where it makes up about 25% of all housing is private rentals. Um, so after, you know, um, right to buy introduced by Thatcher, lots of those homes actually got turned into private rentals who were charging much more than the council was charging before that. Um, so it actually made things worse for a lot of people um, while making things better for some people, obviously, who, who did achieve home ownership that way. Um, it became sort of a, a financial vessel rather than a home. Um, and, she, you know, she scrapped rent controls and things like that. So those are things that really need to be brought back. And um, Sir Bob Kerslake yesterday basically said that, you know, we're going to have a homelessness crisis in the UK if the eviction ban that the government put in place during the pandemic is not reintroduced because so many people can't afford their rent right now um, and are going to be made homeless as a result. Yeah, it's fascinating, actually, because there, there are a lot of people, um, working professionals that I have been seeing struggle to find somewhere affordable to rent in London so that they can get to and from their workplace and, you know, stay in the city where they live or whatever the reason is. But there have been people that have been seriously worried about homelessness um, who don't have family locally to them um, you know parents might live somewhere else in the country or abroad and people are needing to sleep on friends sofas I have just never seen anything like that so it feels like it has got so much worse and um, you know even for people that might be earning above an average wage which is shocking to me um, so what kind of controls are we talking about here? Would it be sort of caps on rent or um, limiting how many homes that you can buy um, so that, you know, you're not buying everything up and then renting it out at extortionate prices? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think we've, um, I mean, even lots of people claiming universal credit at the moment are in employment. And they, they're just needing that to top up what they're getting paid because wages have stagnated so much and not kept up with inflation so much that people are really struggling right now with regards to housing and finding somewhere safe and secure to live um, and affordable, most of all. So I think rent controls, yes, would be talking about sort of capping what landlords can charge um, for, you know, a certain amount of space. But also with regards to sort of multiple home ownership, some things we've been seeing in sort of popular holiday destinations around the UK um, prevent new builds from being bought up by people who already own property. So those are only allowed to be buy, bought by um, people who are first time buyers, which is obviously a really strong idea. Um, and, you know, as well as rentals, we're also seeing like a boom in Airbnbs, people buying, buying second properties to let out as Airbnbs. And essentially what that means is that firstly, those properties are only occupied for part of the year. Um, so they're only, you know, helping tourism, helping the local economy for part of the year for the holiday season. Secondly, they don't always help the local economy that much because obviously people, a lot of people cook for themselves when they're in an Airbnb. So they're not necessarily eating out at local restaurants. They're often buying from the local chain supermarket. Um, and thirdly, obviously, just stops people who actually live in that area, who've grown up in that area, being able to buy those properties because they're going to people who are only there for two or three months out of the year. Um, so that's a really strong policy that, that could be rolled, rolled out more widely. Yeah, really interesting stuff. This is so great, Chloe. I can't even tell you how fantastic <laughs> this is. Thank you. Um, so, th so there's lots going on. And a lot of it is, is quite worrying because we were already in a situation where people were struggling. Um, the pandemic made even more people struggle. Um, 
and you know the wealth gap was already huge and yet there are these new policies that due to our new government that are being sort of spoken about which we just know and the experts know are going to make things a lot worse for you know the less well off what what does anything um make you optimistic about the future are we going to be okay um, do you know what there are actually quite a few things that have made me optimistic about the future especially over the summer hot strike summer that was great you know seeing a surge in unions for the first time in decades really like enormous strikes seeing people mobilize and like recognize their collective power um and basically demand deserved wage increases there was a whole discourse about you know um, people being greedy because they were asking for a single digit increase in their wages when actually we've seen that in the financial services sector and i keep going on about the financial services sector but you know they they were seeing over 30 percent increases in their wages during the like from the start of the pandemic to uh, i think it was the start of this year while everyone else saw a 14% increase on average. So in real terms, it was 23% for that sector, 7% for everyone else. So it's not, you know, it's not greedy for people in these essential services to be asking for more. And especially with inflation where it is, to be asking, you know, they deserve more. Um, So that was like really positive. That made me feel really good. We, um, We have a good blog out on that two of my colleagues joined the um the strikes the train strikes so yeah that's something that's given me a lot of hope um i think growing numbers recognizing the power of their collective voices through campaigns like enough is enough don't pay uk warm this winter um has also been you know i think really really positive and i think we'll actually see you know, we are actually seeing politicians having to take notice because of the enormous numbers of people that are joining these campaigns. Um, and actually, there was a British um, attitude survey released yesterday, which showed that most people agree with, you know, quote unquote, woke positions on issues like racial inequality, uh, immigration, sexual identity. So actually, you know, lots of people do want a better society lots of people do care about the other people in their community and this sort of the flames of this so-called culture war are being stoked by the media and that's not actually representative of how most people in this country feel most people in this country do care and they do want better and they aren't happy with the way things are right now um so yeah basically just people learning to use their collective voice and Um, realizing they have strength in numbers and that there's power in numbers yeah so just thinking about what people can do now so they've heard you talk about the issues and some of the solutions um you know what makes you feel optimistic what can what can ordinary people do are there any actions they can take to support some of the changes that you've been talking about yeah i mean um the first thing I would do is I, I signed the fuel poverty action position petition on um, on free basic energy. It's called Energy for All. Um, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, lots of people have been talking about the cost of Liz Truss's um, freezing the energy price cap. Well, actually, you know, we could be doing something like this instead, which would have a cost, but also you'd be making money from those scaling energy costs for people using lots more than the essential amount of energy. Um, There are lots of organisations like Make My Money Matter who also, you know, give people advice on on what they can do about their pension funds. There are others that talk about bank accounts too and basically how your pension fund and your bank are spending your money without your knowledge and what you can do about that. So, you know, writing to them, writing to your MP, um, actually threatening to change providers, um, So that's always something positive to look into. And then the third thing I would say is just join a union. Um, I'm part of my local renters union and they do really great work in the area. Um, They've stopped a lot of illegal evictions during COVID and they're stopping a lot of forced evictions now. So yeah, join a union. Great. 
I love those tips. Um, so working on these types of topics, it's such a huge job and it's stressful and it's hard and um, it can leave us feeling downbeat. So a question that I have been asking everyone that I speak to is um, what are the kind of activities or habits that you have that remind you or reconnect you with what is good about the world right now? Yeah, so I one of the things I do for work is I put out um, like news roundups in the morning for the whole team. And something I've started doing recently is including, you know, like a positive news section, um, which makes me feel good because, you know, after reading all the negative news, it's nice to have like a positive at the end. And other team members have said that it makes them feel good too. So that's something I like to do. Um, and you can actively seek out that, you know, I, I follow accounts on social media, like Good News Network and Positive News that put out like really uplifting stories across all kinds of things, you know, like wildlife, nature, energy, um, and just like small businesses doing really important things, um, really ingenious things. So those are those are great to follow. And I also follow a lot of campaign groups on social media because it's great to be reminded that there are people out there fighting for change um, and doing good work. And when those groups post their wins, it does make you feel like change is possible. Nice. Can you um, share one of the most heartwarming good news stories that you've read recently so we can kind of end on that note? Okay, let me find one. <laughs> I'll look in my digest and I'll pick my favourite one. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, the last few days they've all been... I mean, I guess Patagonia's owner giving away the company... Um, so that all the billions of profits will go to the climate crisis was really great news. That was really nice. It is also important to um, to recognise that we we shouldn't rely on the on the generosity of billionaires, and we do need the public sector and governments to be doing more. Um, but yeah, it was still really great news. So basically, yeah, the the owner of Patagonia has given away the company so that all the profits of that company will go towards, you know, helping causes that fight the climate crisis. I think it's a Chilean company um, or Argentinian. That's the region, isn't it, Patagonia, um, which has been particularly hit by the climate crisis because they have sort of melting glaciers right at the tip um, and declining, you know, penguin populations and things like that. So it is an area that has been particularly affected by it. Um, so yeah, I think that was a great move. That was really positive. That is billions of pounds going towards the cause. Um, yeah, I don't really know the specifics of um, of the giveaway. That's okay. But That's yeah, right. and you were going to say something about China. Yeah, so um, the Guardian wrote an article on reasons to be cautiously optimistic about the climate, um, which included falling emissions in China, which is obviously the world's biggest polluter, which was great news. Um, what I mentioned earlier, the report from the International Energy Agency, which said that globally more people are now employed in clean energy than the fossil fuel industry, which was great news. Um, and so, yeah, there is there is lots of positive news out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I mean, all of the different issues you're covering are just so incredibly important. And um, it's just great to know that there's people out there working on it and trying to make a difference and coming up with realistic solutions to many of our problems. So thank you. Thanks so much for spending the time with me. Thanks so much for having me.